بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم سٹوڈنٹس ویلکم ٹو لیکچر نمبر ایٹ دس از ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ ٹو پارٹس ون از دا ایج آف چونسن اینڈ دا ون از ایٹین سینچری ناول اینڈ روما اینڈ مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس یو آر ان ہسٹری آف انگلش لٹریچر ہیئر اوکے فرسٹ آف آل ول ٹاک اباؤٹ دا ایج آف چونسن وچ واز اسٹارٹیڈ ان سیونٹین فورٹی فور اینڈ واز اینڈیڈ اپ ان سیونٹین ایٹی فور اینڈ دین ایج آف چونسن مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ول گو فار ایٹین سینچری ناول اینڈ ڈراما and our focus here again would be on the prominent figures uh, uh, in the history of English literature in this particular field. Okay, first of all, this is uh, very much necessary to give you the introduction to the previous sessions. Okay, as uh, in the last class we were dealing with the 18th century literature and the age of Johnson deals with the, the second half of uh, the 18th century, okay. So, uh, the division of the age we did it in the last class, that was uh, like a novel in 18th century. I just gave you the briefing of the novel in 18th century, fine. So, uh, you know, today we'll talk about the novel in 18th century in detail. Drama in 18th century, just introduction was given in the last class. And then the age of Pope, our focus was on the age of Pope. And, uh, you know, we discussed poetry, prose and eminent figure figures during this age. My dear students, sometimes we also put Dryden, who belongs to the Restoration period here in the 18th century, like a spirit. Okay, why? Because this is known as the age of reason. Okay, everything is based on uh, intellect that is based on reason. Fine. So, dear students, but, uh, you know, when we talk about 18th century literature, so that is divided into two eras. One is age of Pope and the other one is uh, uh, age of Johnson. Okay. We already have discussed uh, age of Pope in detail in the last lecture. So today uh, we'll uh, go for, you know, the age of Johnson and we are discussing 18th century literature here. Dear students here, you can see like uh, Johnson age was started in 1750 and it was ended in 1784, okay? So this is comprised of, uh, you know, um, long period in history of English literature. Fine. So, dear students here, you can see like after his death, the classical spirit in English literature begin to give rise t uh, to this romantic spirit. So here again, you'll see a transition phase from classical age to the romantic age. So in next few lectures, we'll talk about romantic age in detail, fine? Obviously, the romantic age started from the year 1798 when Wordsworth and College published the famous Lyrical Barrels. So it was the first publication after that the romantic spirit got its place in English literature, fine. But, you know, after uh, Johnson's death, uh, like, uh, it was, uh, he was the last writer in 18th century and, you know, you know, the last prominent figure in 18th century. So, my dear students, here you can see, like, uh, after his death, uh, like, the romantic spirit uh, got its place uh, in English literature, fine. The poets of the age of Johnson. Okay, first of all, we'll talk about poetry, who are were the eminent poets in the age of Johnson. Okay, an age of transition and experiment, which ultimately led to the Romantic Revival. So that is also known as the age of trans uh, transition and revival. Johnson broke the classical tradition and followed the Romantic trend. So it doesn't mean like jo Johnson belongs to the classical period in the history of English literature. Basically, he used to follow the romantic trends. So he was the first person who uh, introduced romantic trends uh, in literature for the first time. Okay, my dear students here, you'll have to focus on one thing that is very much important, like a classical tradition plus romantic trends. So you can say unofficially the romantic age uh, uh, was started, uh, you know, um, when Johnson started writing his works in romantic trends. So, actually we'll draw a comparison of classical tradition and, uh, you know, romantic trends as well. Then the idea would be quite clear to you. What is basically classicism, okay? Product of intelligence. This is basically a product of intelligence that is known as classicism. Deficient in emotion and imagination because they rejected, uh, you know, uh, emotional world and the imaginative world of human beings. They think whatever uh, is physical or has physical reality, that thing is real. Otherwise, uh, you do not need to go for writing uh, that, that is based on emotional uh, themes or having imaginative elements in that. Okay, town poetry. Previously, we were talking about like uh, in, during the age of Pope, what we did, like uh, they focused on the town poetry and uh, 
they ignored the rural world or the life of the villagers so just just focus focus on the town poetry no love for mysterious supernatural elements so basically here dear students you can see like uh, again all the points are there uh, all the points are in interlinked with each other they do not have any place for emotion or imagination and uh, they deny the mysterious supernatural elements as well they just focus on intellectual and you know that is everything is based on reason another point uh, relevant to classicism is didactic fine like uh, everything is informative and the poets or the writers duty is to uh, you know uh, deliver that information to that the other person insisted writer to follow the prescribed rules and imitate the standard model of writing fine here students you can just see like at that time writers they do not have any kind of liberty to write in whatever way they wanted to actually they were insisted they were forced to write uh, according to the prescribed rules and to imitate the standard models of writing so here dear students just have a look on this uh, you know the last point like uh, due to uh, you know this tradition among the classical writers or the poets you can see like uh, the writers they could not produce that much good work why because uh, you know they were just limited to uh, some certain trends and there wasn't any element of creativity uh, in the writings of that time you can see and that is why their writings are not that mu that much universal and they are known as classical writings only okay and they are just limited to that specific era in the history of english literature fine romanticism previously that was a uh, you know classicism product of intelligence and that everything is based on reason on logic and they focused on town poetry and uh, they didn't have any love for supernatural elements that was directed and writers were forced to write uh, according to some parameters which are already set by somebody fine so what is basically romanticism encourage emotions passion and imagination here dear students you can see that romanticism is a movement which is uh, absolutely against classicism because they focused on emotions and on passions and on imagination as well so here dear students uh, you'll have to uh, draw a comparison of both the literary uh, you know trends uh, in the history of english literature what is classicism and what is romanticism many times i told you whenever we uh, we enter into new phase or into the new age uh, in the history of english literature you can see like uh, we reject the previous uh, you know uh, trends and the models which uh, previous uh, poets and writers they used to follow this is common okay so basically they encourage their writers to write about nature about beauty and you know uh, about the worldly things as well fine romantic spirit was basically love of the mysterious the supernatural okay so here we'll talk about the supernatural poets and those who love for the mysterious things as well fine so that is basically relevant to the romantic spirit another era in the history of english literature simple and natural form expression so previously you you can see like uh, when we were talking about the age of uh, johnson or the age of pope but johnson was the first one who introduced uh, romantic trends like as far as the age of pope is concerned so you could see during that period writers they were forced to write within limits and they were supposed to write uh, within the limits of some set and rules okay which are already um, standardized by somebody else fine so here the form and the expression of you know poetry that is very simple and uh, that is very natural as well you in other words you can see like uh, this is spontaneous uh, expression liberty of the poet in terms of choosing themes and manners of writing so here dear students you can see the writers were not forced to be within any kind of limit they were like uh, free to choose any kind of a theme any manner of writing so here we are talking about the contents plus the style of their writing they didn't have any restriction as far as the themes or the manners of writing were concerned here dear students let me tell you that we are discussing romanticism that is an that is uh, an opposite uh, you know approach of classicism fine
Goldsmith was the uh, one of the prominent writers of that time. He believed that classical standards of writing poetry were the best. So basically, Goldsmith was the uh, you know only writer who appreciated uh, you know classical standards of writing, and he used to think that these methods are best. Okay, his works, The Traveler, The Deserted Village, you can see. You can see the classical spirit uh, in his writings, plus the didactic, like in that is based on information. Okay, last work of artificial 18th century literature. So basically, that is the last work of 18th century literature that used to follow, you know, the classical model or the classical standards uh, while writing any kind of work. Touches of New Age Romanticism, but there. That's n uh, that is not pure based on the classicism. Here you can see, like in his works, you can see the touches of new age romanticism. For example, in his second work, you can see the deserted village. Like uh, when we were talking about the classical age in the history of English literature, so uh, you can see uh, like uh, they used to write about to towns only. Okay, they used to write about towns only. Why? Because they, you know, uh, neglected. They ignored the. Villagers' life, or they ignored the rural life of any country. Fine. So here, the deserted village. It means that you can see some of the trends, some of the tastes uh, of uh, romantic romanticism in his work. Okay, treatment of uh, nature and rural life. So here, you can see like Goldsmith work. Their combination of classical. Plus romantic literature, fine, because he focused on rural world. He focused on deserted village, and uh, you know the way he treated nature. Those are the elements of romanticism, and not of you know the age of pop or the age of reason, fine. Or you know you cannot find these elements in uh, classical age. Poets of the age of Johnson. These are the names of uh, some eminent poets who used to write during the age of Johnson. James Thomson, Thomas Gray, William Collins, James Macpherson, William Black, Robert Burns, William Cowper, George Crabbe. So these are the eminent poets from the age of Johnson. Okay. Thomas Gray. Okay, he is the writer of elegy written in a country churchyard. Fine. So basically, this is a manifestation to deep feeling of the poet. And emotions. Okay, so basically he dealt with the, you know uh, you can say feelings and emotions, the things uh, which were not present in classical literature, and uh, it is dependent upon the feelings and the emotions of the poet. And in this work, he dealt with the theme of universal theme of death. Fine. So here, dear students, like uh, according to classicism, death is also something which is imaginative, which uh, Doesn't have any reality, but here you can see like Thomas Gray, although he belonged to 18th century literature, but still he talked about theme of death. So you can see the essence of romanticism here in his work. Okay, the progress of poetry. This is another work, and the Brad. Brad is you can see more original and romantic independence of the poet. So basically here you can see like as far as uh, romantic uh, elements of the works uh, of his work. Uh, Uh, are concerned, so you can see this is more original and more romantic as compared to rest of his works. His poems follow the classical model in form, but the spirit is romantic. So here, you, dear students, you can have an analysis that uh, in form, like as far as uh, you can say, the use of language, the use of uh, literary terms are concerned, or you can say the way the poet has used the language, those are classical, but their spirit is romantic. So. Here, this is basically a combination of both the spirits. Okay, both the trends, both the models. One is classical, and the other one is romantic. Okay. Here, one more example relevant to Goldsmith again. Here again, Oriental uh, eclogues. Basically, that was that has a romantic element, but that is written in classical tradition. Okay. So these are his well-known works: Ode to Simplicity, Ode to Fear, Ode to the Passion, How Sleep the Brave, Ode to evening and uh, basically in all his works he uh, focused on uh, you know nature so here as far as the form is concerned basically he followed the classical tradition and uh, you know uh, for feeling and for expression of the thoughts you can say basically the themes are romantic in nature he dealt with nature and with the life fine right? james uh, macpherson uh, his work 
Works of Ossians. So this is uh, his uh, work's name. Translation of Gaelic Folk Literature. So basically this is uh, a translation of Gaelic literature. Okay. So this is his work. William Blake, a well-known uh, poet uh, from the later half of the 18th century. Complete break from classical poetry. So basically here, my dear students, you can say like previously Goldsmith and other poets, they used to follow the classical trends plus the romantic spirit in their poetry. Basically, they introduced romantic spirit at the end of the 18th century. But here you can see William Black, he completely broke the classical poetry, okay? And he entered into the new, you know, um, trend of writing poetry. His works, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, contains poem, Little Lamb Who Made Thee, Tigger, Tigger, Burning Bright, the marriage of heaven and hell. So here basically he wrote about nature a lot and he did not follow any classical tradition while writing the poetry. So my dear students here we can see like William Black was the first person who introduced you know um, romanticism in poetry who broke all the rules of the classical poetry as far as the forms or the themes of classical poetry are concerned. Fine. Robert Barnes, another poet, he is basically a greatest songwriter in English language, great lover of nature. You can see the essence of romantic spirit here in the works of all the English poets. Okay, his works are The Quarter Saturday Night, To a Mouse, To a Mountain Daisy, Man Was Made to Mourn. Okay, so in his work, you can see the Elizabethan touch in most of his songs. So, Instead of uh, following any classical writer, so he followed Elizabethan, uh, you know, writers maybe. So, you can see the Elizabethan touch in most of his songs, okay? I hope, my dear students, you are learning the things. William Cowper, his works are the task on the receipt of my mother's picture. Alexander Selkirk, translation of Homer in blank verse. So, all the natural elements are present in his works as well. The romantic spirit is present in their works. Fine. George Crabbe, another writer in, uh, you know, the later half of the 18th century. Between the August Augustans and Romantics, okay, basically he fall between the Augustans and the Romantics or you can say in other words, uh, between Classics and uh, Romantics. Fine. In form he is Classical, but in tempo he is Romantic again. So as far as the, you know, the use of language is concerned, you know, the kind of uh, um, techniques he used in order to write uh, his, uh, you know, work, that was classic, but temper again is romantic. The themes he followed, that those are romantic, okay? His works are the village, the parish, register, the borough, tales in verse, tales of the hall, okay? So here, in all his works, you can see the that classical plus romantic traditions were being followed. How? In form, he used classical traditions and in contents or in temper, you can say, or while using the themes, he gave uh, them a romantic touch. Dear students here, you can see like we are over with the, all the eminent poets uh, from the age of Johnson. We are moving towards prose now. Fine. The tradition made by the writers of the earlier part of the 18th century, as we already have seen in the first part of the 18th century, like uh, we focused on Edison's work, Stelle and Swift's work as well. So the, uh, the tradition of, you can see, like, uh, these three writers were carried out in the later half of the 18th century as well. That is the age of Johnson, fine. 18th century is called the age of aristocracy, okay? So this whole century is basically called the age of aristocracy. So here you can see the similar elements which are present in the 18th century in both the ages. One is the age of Pope and the other one is the age of Johnson. So the well-known writers of, uh, you know, prose here in the last half of the 18th century are Johnson, Brooke and Gibbon. So... Dear students, for the first time we are introducing Johnson over here, so we will talk about him in detail, fine? Samuel Johnson, his full name is Samuel Johnson, literary dictator of the age. So basically he is the only prominent figure of that age and that is why he is known as the dictator of, the, of this age. He was the 
only ruler of that age. He struggled against poverty and ill health. So here dear students you can say like he dealt with the topics which are relevant to lower class or middle class. Fine. Very kind, helpful to the poor. So he was very kind, he was very helpful and um, he was uh, very generous to poor people. Okay, dear students, here you can see these are his eminent works. Okay, the dictionary and lives of poet. Basically, that is uh, based on uh, the biographies of all the poets. Okay, so if you want to know about any poets, you just need to consult this book of uh, him. Okay, that is known as the dictionary and lives of poet. The other one is the rambler and the Edler and then the wrestler. So these are his well-known works. Fine. Edmund Burke, another prose writer. Fine. Member of Parliament for 30 years. So here, my dear student, you can see that he is uh, a part of a political system of that time as well. He was basically a political philosopher. He wrote about the political issues. His works uh, include Thoughts on the Present Discontent, on American Textation, that is a parliamentary speech, on Conciliation with America, that is again a speech, the reflection on the French Revolution. So you can see the element of universality that is also one of the characteristic of literature in his work and then full of enthusiasm and he was fearless though he was the part of a parliament and he was uh, you know um, the elected member of a parliament you can see. He was fearless, he didn't have any kind of fear from government or somebody else and you can see the element of enthusiasm in his uh, works as well fine and the element of universality that is very much common and the name of uh, you know the prose writer is uh, Edmund Brooke okay Edward Gibbon first historian in England who wrote in literary manner so he was basically the first historian in uh, England who wrote in literary manner works the decline and fall of the Roman Empire so basically he was a historian so he used to write about uh, you know the past events uh, and different occasions okay he was authoritative and uh, this is his well documented history okay so this is history book that is very well known and has an uh, authoritative element in it as well fine so basically history books these are very much uh, you know different from other kind of uh, literature books but he was the first man who used to write in literary manner like in form of prose or in form of poetry so he followed the prose uh, you know uh, guidelines in order to uh, present his history books fine letters and diaries so here dear students with the passage of time you can see like uh, biographies and autobiographies were introduced previously and now there is one more concept that is the letters and diaries so my dear students here you might be confused at why letters and diaries they are part of literature so i'll tell you don't worry lady mary worley montague's letter so basically these letters these are published letters or these are the diaries and the letters which were found after the death of the author so they are part of literature as well because they used to talk about certain events, certain occasion in those letters and diaries as well. So here these diaries and letters they are a true reflection of you can see uh, the society of that time and if you want to write a biography of any person. So again this is a very good practice to consult letters and diaries which are written by that very person okay Lord Chesterfield letters to uh, his son so he used to write letters for his son so uh, these are also part of uh, you know prose of uh, 18th century the diaries of Samuel Pepe describing the period between 1660 and, and 1669 here this is again about history this is about 18th century okay the way he described uh, the period and the different events and the occasions during that period so uh, that is present in his diaries uh, okay John Eleven's diary so here you can see two examples of letters and two examples of diaries they are also part of literature because of the universality element which is present there so you might like uh, these are written in a spontaneous way as well without thinking like uh, 
when you intentionally write any kind of literature so definitely you need to be conscious but while writing uh, diaries especially so that is your spontaneous effort as well you so you can find out uh, the elements which are necessary to write a biography so these are very helpful as well letters to son so these are confidential and private letters as well so the kind of discussion which is going on between two people that is also very much important in order to write down the biography of that person or in order to write the history books what was basically going on at that time okay we are over with the first part of the lecture and that is also that is the age of johnson fine so i just want you i just want to share the summary of the lecture with you we discussed the age of Johnson, the poets in the age of Johnson and then the prose in the age of Johnson and then uh, the last thing was the letters and diaries during the age of Johnson, okay? Basically what you have to keep in mind one thing that basically this is a, a transition period from classical thoughts to romantic thoughts. So this is a, a shift of, you know, classical thoughts to romantic thoughts, fine? Here we have, this is Pope, age of Pope, and this is age of Johnson, fine? So, Roman, intro, introduce, introduced, romantic. So here for the first time you can see like uh, Johnson in the era of Johnson you can see like uh, they have introduced romanticism and then you can see a transition a shift from this whole era is uh, classical. Then you can see a shift of classical to romantic fine. So basically this is the thing. So uh, here students you can see like uh, basically uh, age of Johnson there you can see uh, the spirit of romanticism were present there so there is a certain transition from the classical ages to the romantic ages in the history of English literature. So basically you just have to keep in mind that most of the writers they used to write uh, their works uh, having uh, form from the classical spirit and uh, you know they were following romantic trends as well as the themes uh, of you know their writings were concerned that was basically the main point and which differentiates uh, you know um, two ages one is the age of pope and the other one is the age of johnson because romantic spirit was uh, introduced at that time during the age of johnson but you know officially it got started in uh, at the end of the 18th century with the publication of the lyrical ballads by william wordsworth and coleridge fine official start of the age was took place uh, from that publication but you know you can see the essence or the feeling of romantic spirit which was present in johnson's writings or in other people's writings fine Okay, again I am explaining the previous part of the lecture to you which uh, we, are, uh, we already have covered. We are over with the age of Johnson, the eminent poets and the prose writers and the diaries and letters from that era, fine. So dear students, second part of lecture that is the 18th century novel and drama. So far we are over with the, you can say, uh, the age of Pope and the age of Johnson. So here, you know, novel and drama, they are not restricted to, you know, one particular part of the century. This is, we are going to talk about 18th century drama and novel as a whole, as a part of whole century, okay? First of all, I'll give you the background and the situation which was there in England and then the, that is known as the age of enlightenment as well, 18th century. Then we'll focus on the 18th century novel and 18th century drama and then the important figures. In the last lecture, students, I just gave you the briefing uh, to the 18th century novel and the 18th century drama. So we are going to talk about, you know, these two uh, genres in the history of English literature in detail today. Again, I'm telling you that we are going to focus on uh, novel and drama in the 18th century, fine? Okay, what was going on at that time? Uh, 
you know, during the age of, you know, uh, Johnson or, or of Pope, fine. And basically in 18th century, what was going on, okay. After the tempestuous events of the 17th century, England entered a period of comparatively peaceful development. The glorious revolution of 1688 ended and England became a constitutional monarchy. So here you can see the transition of political one political you know uh, phase to another one as well so the glorious revolution of 1688 that was ended and now England has become a constitutional monarchy fine the 18th century England witnessed uh, unprecedented technical innovations with which equipped industry with steam and new tools and rapid growth of industry and commerce. This is called the Industrial Revolution. So, 18th century, in 18th century, we can see here that there was an Industrial Revolution in England at that time. Great changes also took place in rural England with the enclosure movement. The majority of peasants were reigned, uh, driven off their land, went to the cities and became workers. So, that is why this is, you know, the places or you know their lands they were uh, they were taken off by the government so that is why they had to move to the urban uh, you know uh, area they had to move to the city to the urban area they became workers over there they started working in different uh, companies and in different industries okay that is why we can say that the in industrial revolution uh, it took place in 18th century fine it is age of enlightenment as well. Enlightenment in Europe, the 18th century marked the beginning of an intellectual movement in Europe known as the Enlightenment. So basically this is an intellectual movement which was on the whole an expression of struggle of the bureaucracy against feudalism was going on at that time. The Enlighteners fought, ag fought against class inequality stagnation, prejudices and other survival of feudalism. So basically this is why this is known as the enlightenment movement because it is against feudalism. People started uh, you know fighting uh, uh, for their rights and uh, they started fighting for inequality and prejudices and uh, stagnation uh, uh, in the society. They attempted to place all branches of science at the service of mankind and connecting them with the actual needs and requirements of people. So here be, my dear students you can see that they attempted to place all branches of science and they used to utilize all the branches of science for the development of human beings and they used to uh, utilize it for you know uh, for the betterment of the humanity of the mankind so that is why this is known as the enlightenment in Europe there was they uh, they started taking a stand against the feudal practices of that era fine again I would like to explain what is classicism because here we are going uh, uh, in a parallel way like we we have to draw a comparison between classicism and uh, you know uh, romanticism time and again classicism is basically an attitude to literature that is guided by admiration of the qualities of formal balance proportion decorum and restraint attributes to the major works of ancient greek and roman literature so again the same same thing is being repeated over here like uh, they they have set their rules and regulations and you know they have to follow the formal balance here okay and proportions decorum restraints attributed to the major work because basically they are following the ancient greek and roman literature traditions here fine as a literary doctrine, classicism holds the writer must be governed by rules, models or conventions rather than by inspiration. So basically, it was a very common doctrine of that time, like the writers, uh, they have to follow certain rules, certain models and conventions uh, and they cannot, uh, you know, uh, follow their inspiration, their imagination. Neoclassicism required the observance of the rules. Uh, uh, derived from Aristotle's poetics and uh, Horace, you know, Ars Poetica. So here, dear students, uh, basically classicism that deals with the classical literature that was present in ancient and uh, Greek uh, history. Fine. Edison, Stille and Pope belong to the school of classicism. Basically, their literature is purely based on classical thoughts okay the classicists model themselves on Greek and Latin authors again and try to control literary creation by some fixed laws and rules drawn from Greek and Latin works rhymed couplet instead of blank works so basically this is uh, you know 
um, these are certain rules which Greek and Latin uh, uh, you know scholars they used to uh, follow uh, when uh, writing uh, any kind of uh, you know um, literary work fine so they preferred writing in rhymed cap couplet instead of blank words later on you'll see in uh, romanticism the writers they will be free to write anything in any manner but here the rules and the regulations which are derived from uh, you know Aristotle's poetics and Herak uh, uh, Ars Poetica so certain rules are present there in uh, you know this book uh, Aristotle's poetics and Herak Ars Poetica as well like uh, how to write poetry like they prefer using a rhyme proper rhyme scheme for that and uh, they at that time they did not allow their writers to use blank words fine the three unities of time, place, and action. Okay, so you have to follow if you are a classical writer, if you are, uh, you know, if you belong to that period, that era in literature. So here you'll have to follow these unities, which are, uh, which belong to ancient Greek and Latin literature, like uh, unities of time, place, and action. Poetry following the ancient division. So basically, at that time, they used to follow the ancient divisions. Okay, like. Um, certain unities were there time place and action and these unities are present in Aristotle's poetics fine so you'll have to take care of you know all the things uh, which were present in Greek and Latin literature of that time so here dear students basically this is known as classicism because uh, that was uh, a revival of you can say or the application of Greek, ancient Greek and Latin literature uh, you know in English literature and they had to follow certain traditions of that time that is why they are known as classic writers fine the rise of English novel in the 18th century okay the modern European novel began after the Renaissance with the Cavantes the modern European novel began after the Renaissance with the Cavantes uh, you know Don uh, Quixote in Six, uh, f uh, during the period 1605 to 1615 so here you can see like it was introduced in the 17th century fine so the modern English novel began two centuries later in the 18th century so uh, that can be like uh, at the end of the 18th century like uh, the English novel uh, got its place fine that is why roughly it, it is you know it is a period of two centuries the rise and growth of the realistic novel is the most prominent achievement of 18th century English literature. So here dear students you can have like uh, the rise, uh, the, the novel was on the climax over here, fine, during the uh, 18th century. Swift's Gulliver Travels, Dauphin's Robinson Crusoe and Richardson Pamela, Clarissa and Sir Charles uh, Grandison, okay, and Sir Charles Grandison Fielding novels uh, unfold a panorama of life in all sections of English society. Basically, Fielding was the real founder of the realistic novel in England. So, basically, the themes of uh, his novels are from the real life world, okay? So, Henry Fielding is, uh, you know, well-known author, okay? Another 18th century novelist of the realistic school was Smollett, the author of Roderick Random and Humph. Humphrey Clanker. So uh, here, uh, my dear students, you can see like uh, Henry Fielding. He is the founder of the realistic novel in England, and another writer is Smollett, and his works like uh, um, Roderick Random and Humphrey Clanker. These are the well-known works which are done by Smollett. The new element of sen sentiment or sensibility was added to the novel by Stern, who Tristram Shandy whose uh, Tristram Shandy was the strangest novel in English literature. So basically, the elements of realism here present in these works, okay? So here basically we'll focus on uh, some of the important novels of the 18th century, fine? So that is all about the background of the novel. Why? Because, uh, you know, uh, for the very first time, the modern novel was introduced uh, in that century. That is why it's very much important. And these are the names of, you know, uh, different... Um, novelists here fine okay let me explain uh, why novel is important and uh, you know how did it uh, give birth in the 18th century birth of the novel where there's this association of newness and originality occurs in the 18th century so writers they added some new elements there and some original elements uh, from the life uh, to the you know novel that is why 
the novel uh, took its birth. Before that, there had been forms of long and continuous narrative prose. So previously, people used to write prose and, you know, in form of uh, narrative kind of things. But it was only in the 1720s that we began to see the emergence of a recognizable novel form. In 1720s, as you can see, like uh, the emergence of the novel. And it concerned with the realistic depiction of middle class life. So basically their focus was like in 18th century literature, if you go for the analysis of novels, you can see like their focus was on middle class life. So all the characters usually they are from middle class society. Values and experiences showing the development of individual and individuatic character over time. Their focus was on, you know, uh, middle class society and on individual experiences as well and the societies and the values of that very society, okay? Contrast with the forms of Elizabethan and Jacobian drama concerned either with the aristocracy or with the gratuitous investigation of low life. So basically, you can see like uh, in Elizabethan and Jacobian drama, the focus was either on aristocracy or on low class. So here, they followed the middle way to write about middle class society. In terms of the subsequent development of the novel, that is the realist 19th century novel, the period of the 18th century is a mixture of consolidation and experimentation, either establishing foundation or of experimenting with new possibilities. So here, when we will be talking about 19th century novels, so you can see like uh, with the passage of time, novel uh, kept on developed, fine. So here, for the first time in the 18th century, they, uh, they set the traditions and different possibilities and, you know, they established the foundations as well to write a novel, fine. A pastorary form, confession, rock poetry, rock biography, anti-romance, uh, Picasso, moral tact, uh, okay. So these were basically the themes of the novels in the 18th century, fine. They had the, the more important point from this slide is they have, they had the realistic uh, depiction of the middle class. So when you read Henry Fielding's novel or other, you know, well-known novels of that era, so you'll see a middle class touch there, okay, a middle class mentality would be there and you can draw a contrast of the Elizabethan and the Jacobian drama as well where the focus was either on aristocracy or, you know, on uh, the investigation of the low life but not on the middle class. So here you can see a new trend which was introduced in the 18th century novel, the focus on, uh, you know, the life of the middle class people, fine. Major novelists of that time were Daniel Dauphé, Samuel Richardson, Henry Fielding, uh, Tobias Smollett, Lawrence Tan. Okay, Lawrence Tan, Daniel Dauphé, Samuel Richardson, Henry Fielding, Tobias Smollett, Lawrence Tan, fine. Daniel Dauphé, he was a novelist. First of all, I'll just give you a briefing about, you know, uh, Daniel Dofe, who was basically he. He was born in London, the son of a butcher. As a merchant, Dofe had seen ups and downs in his business. He became bankrupt in 1692. Within four hours, he was doing well again as the manager of a tile factory. He remained in fairly prosperous circumstances until he was ruined in 1703 by his imprisonment. Dauphé was a kind of jack of all trades. He was a merchant, economist, politician, journalist, uh, pamphleteer, publicist and novelist as well. So here you can see his too many dimen dimension in his uh, personality. He was a son of butcher and as a merchant so he he faced too many ups and downs in his life so basically he could uh, Obviously, when you experience too many things in your life, so that would be reflected in your works as well. So, as uh, you can say, the part of the English societies, there were too many ups and downs in his life. So, he has, uh, you know, depicted all the experiences in a very good way in his novels. Fine. These are basically his works uh, toured through the whole island of Great Britain. Okay, Robinson Crusoe, this is a landmark in the history of English literature. Uh, Journal of the Flag Year, okay, Maul Flander, Roxana. Roxana, okay, these are his well-known works, fine. So, uh, among all these works, Robinson Crusoe is the most famous work which is written by Daniel Dauphé, okay. 
the other novelist in in you know 18th century that is Samuel Richardson here my dear students I just want to uh, I just want to give you a briefing of the works of different people fine his greatest works are Pamela Clarissa or the history of a young lady the history of Sir Charles Grandison so here you can see his uh, two works these are based on the histories okay so his, uh, you can see the biographical elements are present here these are about the lives of uh, these two people one is a young lady and the other one is Sir Charles Grandison okay and the first one is Pamela fine Henry Fielding his works are an apology for the life of Mrs. Shamela Andrews okay the history of the adventures of Joseph Andrews the history of Tom Jones a foundling the life of Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great and Amelia so basically my dear students here you can see like uh, among all these works the history of adventures of jo Joseph Andrews uh, that is a very much popular work by him he took uh, the basis of, for his novel from uh, the previous from Samuel Richardson okay and he took an inspiration from his work Pamela and you can see character of Pamela is present in Henry Fielding's works as well fine Tobias Smollett his works are the adventures of Roderick Random the adventures of uh, Peregrine Pickle the expedition of Humphrey Clinker so he, these are his famous works okay my dear students here you can see like uh, their works most of the writers who, who used to write in the 18th century their works are based on some kind of adventures or history is fine so basically they uh, you know they came up with a trend of writing modern novels at that time they came out of you know writing uh, uh, the typical tragedies and comedies of Elizabethan or of Shakespearean times fine so they introduced the modern novel for the first time because uh, they focused on the middle class of that uh, society Daniel Dofi and you can see like uh, the elements of uh, you know the different elements and the factors which are uh, uh, involved in the formulation of the society how these writers they have presented them uh, those factors in their lives so these are the works which are written by Tobias Smollett okay Lawrence Tan his works are Tristram Shandy and the other one is Sentimental Journey through France and Italy so dear students here you can see like uh, as I told you before as well you know their works are based on adventures on histories on the life uh, style of people in, in a particular society or you know a sentimental journey, journey to France and Italy so here you will see like the elements which are present there like uh, the, how France and Italy these are different countries okay so uh, these are the works which are written by written by Lawrence Tan another part of the lecture today is the 18th century drama so so far we are over with the age of Johnson then we focused on uh, the novel uh, of the 18th century and then now here we are on 18th century drama dramatic literature was not of high order as you ca you could see during the Elizabethan period like uh, the writers they were on the top at that time and uh, you know the dramas and the plays which they wrote at that time they are still you know um, very much popular but the dramatic literature the dramas the comedies uh, you can see, in other words you can see the comedies and the tra tragedies which are written during that time the 18th century period those are not of high order okay reason what was basically the reason of decline you might be thinking like sometimes drama is popular sometimes poetry is present and sometimes you can see novel is present so here you can see uh, as compared to any other work, uh, uh, novel is on the top uh, during the 18th century. Fine. So, what were basically the reasons of decline of uh, 18th century drama? That was the Licensing Act of 1773, which curtailed the freedom of expression of dramatists. Like dra uh, dramatists, they have to, uh, you know, follow certain traditions, certain rules in order to write dramas, in order to depict. English society of that time said they had certain restrictions at that time so here dear students you can see that because of this licensing act like you will have to get a license uh, uh, from your state in order to write dramas and that you know there were certain uh, there were too many rules uh, and uh, you know dramatists they were bound uh, uh, within uh, certain limits okay good writers left theater okay for example Henry Fielding he was a, a very good dramatist but you know he left theater because they were not allowed to express their thoughts in a free way okay so that is why good writers like Henry Fielding he left the 
theater and he moved towards you know uh, novel writing okay so that is one of the uh, important factors which is uh, one of the important factors which is involved in the decline of drama of 18th century it was not a peak uh, due to the licensing act of 1737 okay tragedy when we talk about drama there are two types of dramas one is the tragedy and the other one is uh, comedy fine influence of romantic and classical tra uh, traditions again you can see like a uh, the age of Johnson, the romantic concepts were introduced at that time. Fine, so you can say romantics, romanticism took its birth in uh, during the age of Johnson. So, basically, the tragedy of that time of the 18th century tragedy. We are here talking about the 18th century tragedy. So, it has uh, uh, you know a great influence of romantic and classical traditions, maybe in form, maybe in content. So, or you can see like themes again. Like same is the case with poetry, which we already have covered. Like poetry writers, they used to follow uh, form from the classical uh, traditions, but they were not bound as far as the themes of uh, their poetry. The writers used to follow the themes from the modern tradition, or you can say from the romantic tradition. So, my dear students, uh, you can see the elements of uh, romanticism and classicism in tragedy. Okay, romantic Elizabethan way of writing, basically. Uh, romantic as far as romantic tra tragedies are concerned they are written in the Elizabethan way violence and horror on the open stage so theater of that time you can say like uh, writers they used to write tragedies tragedies in that way that when you present it on the stage so violence and the elements of horror were there on the open stage okay classical how they were using the classical traditions as far as the tragedy of that time is concerned. French traditions of writing tragedies, so as you, you can see like the Roman, Greek and Italian literatures, uh, literature, they used to follow like classical writers, they used to follow these, uh, you know, um, traditions. So, uh, while writing tragedies, they used to follow French traditions of writing tragedies and unfolding of a single action without any subplot. Basically, those tragedies were dependent upon single action only without having any subplot or, you know, sequences of uh, different actions were not there. That is, uh, the whole story revolves around one story, okay, or one single action was there. Okay, works, for example, uh, like uh, tragedies, uh, uh, tragedies which are written by different people, these are uh, Outways, Venice, Preserved. Addison's uh, Cato, James Thompson's Sophonishba, okay, Dr. Johnson's Irony. So, my dear students, here you can see, like, by following the romantic as well as the classical traditions of writing tragedies, you can see, like, these uh, these writers, they produce their works in that way. The Elizabethan touch of uh, writing is there, and the elements of horror and uh, violence was there on the open stage, and, uh, you know, the classical elements which are present there were the French traditions they used to follow, and they used to have only one action in the play without having any subplot or different other actions in the story. So that was all about tragedy. The other one is comedy. And these are the comedies which are written by different people. Stelle, these comedies, the funeral, the laying, uh, you know, a lover, the laying lover, the tender husband, the conscious lovers, okay. Goldsmith, the vicar of Wakefield, the deserted village, she stoops to conquer. Richard, Brinsley Sheridan, the rivals, the school of for scandal. So these are basically the comedy comedies which were written during the 18th century. Fine. Okay, the references which uh, from where I got uh, the information for the today's lecture uh, were a critical history of English literature by David Ditches, a critical history of English literature by Dr. Mullick, and this is a website. You can have uh, you can have this link, and if you want to explore the details of the lectures lecture today, so you can have a look on this uh, link as well. Okay, dear students, let me repeat the lecture today, some of the important points which are very much important. You can see the age of, first of all, we talked about the age of Johnson and the eminent uh, poets and the prose writers uh, from the age of Johnson. First of all, we can see there is a transition phase, okay, transition from classical thoughts to the romantic thoughts during the age of Johnson's. You can see uh, writers, they used to write with the, you know, uh, classical spirit along with having, you know, romantic trends in their writings, okay. 
most of the writers what they did they used to follow the classical form or the classical style of writing but the themes they were from the romantic spirit fine so a combination of both the eras one is classical and the other one is uh, romantic uh, you can see in the writings of the people of 18th century okay the later half of the 18th century fine so what we did then we we covered the poets eminent poets and the prose writers of uh, you know the age of johnson then our focus was on the 18th century novel and 18th century drama okay first of all let me tell you some of the things uh, like uh, from 18th century novel 18th century novel was on the top now novel you can say took its birth in the 18th century why because uh, people they uh, they diverted their attention from uh, from low and from aristocratic classes of society to the middle class because people were of the view like uh, this is very much essential to know the psyche of the middle class because uh, basically they are the workers okay why they shifted their attention because there was a rev industrial revolution which was going on in 18th century people uh, who were deprived from their lands and you know from their property by the government or by the ruling class so here my dear students you can see like when they move to uh, the city area so you can see like they be they become workers in different industries that is why this is known as industrial revolution plus uh, you can see that is why their focus was on the middle class okay previously they might belong to the low class but they when when they enter into the cities and when they started working in different industries so they become part of the middle class so according to the novelists of uh, the 18th century you can see like most of they were just trying to observe the psyche of the middle class a transition of you know elizabethan thought and jacobian thought uh, with the you can say with the focus on the middle class okay then we uh, talked about you know drama drama uh, in the 18th century could not get that much popularity why because of uh, you know the licensing act of that time and it banned the writers to not to write about certain topics during that age and the writers they were bound and they thought they didn't have that much freedom to write about anything that is why they left the theater okay and they moved towards novel writing fine so here my dear student then we talked about you know the tragedies and the comedies which were written at that time during all the era like uh, Uh, during the age of johnson or as a whole in the 18th century when we focused on the novel and the drama of the 18th century so my dear students you could see like uh, some of the elements from the next age uh, were present there in uh, you know 18th century like uh, elements from you know romantic age you can see in this 18th century literature as well fine so here my dear student you can see like a romantic movement was uh, uh, you know getting started in 18th century writers they used to follow uh, classical as well as the romantic trends uh, while writing any kind of thing fine so then you could see that the writers in the age of johnson or as a whole in 18th century they started writing about nature and you know imaginative things and the things which are based on your dreams okay and then they were not bound basically they were not bound to write according to any uh, you know uh, standard criteria or according to the set rules of writing poetry or you know novel or drama they were just free that is why their response was quite spontaneous and most of the things which they wrote the, those were in blank words and why because they were just violating the traditions of the classical period that is like you'll have to follow certain ancient greek and uh, latin literature traditions of uh, that time so it was uh, being violated during the era of the 18th century and you could see the clear cut example of these things uh, when we were talking about goldsmith okay although he was uh, like he had uh, taken from ancient greek and latin literature but his contents and his uh, themes they were they belong to the uh, you know romantic romantic movement in the history of english literature my dear student here the point is that like uh, again i'm telling you and i repeat it at the end of every lecture whenever we talk about the history of english literature so it doesn't mean like you have to memorize all the 
dates on fingertips. Uh, it doesn't mean. History means to know about people of that particular society, to know about what was going on at that time in any particular era, the political movements which were going on, the religious changes, the societal changes which were happening at that time and how did they influence the literature of that time. Okay. So, all these things, they would be very helpful for you while analyzing any piece of literature, okay? So, you'll have to make uh, it an interdisciplinary approach uh, while, uh, you know, talking about uh, literature or while analyzing any kind of literature. For example, if you want to uh, analyze uh, Henry Fielding's uh, uh, Joseph Andrews, so what you have to do, like the psychological elements which are present there and the autobiographical elements uh, which are there in the novel or what was the situa political situation at that time, what was the religion at that time, who was the ruling party at that time, everything and then you could analyze the things in a better way. The other important point uh, which you have to keep in mind while uh, you know talking about the history of English literature is that like uh, with the passage of time the language also got developed okay like uh, we, we took a start with the Anglo-Saxon period in the history of English literature and you could see at that time uh, there was old English okay and today we cannot understand even a single word of old English and that was written in you know a different script as well and at that time we didn't have the uh, printing machines fine so everything was in manuscript form and you know uh, even the literature is not present today okay and the literature of Anglo-Saxon period that is based on the oral histories then you could see the medieval uh, period in the history of English literature that was all about, uh, you know, Middle English period. Some of the changes uh, were made as far as the old English was concerned, fine. Then you could see the Renaissance period or the Elizabethan age, fine. And then we move towards the Restoration and, you know, uh, the age of Pope and the age of Johnson and the Puritan age as well, previously before the Restoration period. So here, my dear students, you could see like you'll have to draw a comparative study of all the periods in the history of English literature so in this way you'll be able to understand English literature in a quite good way so that was all about today the age of Johnson the novel and the drama in the 18th century so hope uh, you liked my lecture today and uh, see you again uh, with another topic thank you